The next reading of God's word this morning comes from Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to, to 30. Let's stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. <clears throat> Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 7. This is God's word. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised, for it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him, and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him, all that they had done and taught. So far the reading of God's holy word, we give thanks for it. You may be seated. And as we turn to consider this passage, let us pray for God's help. O Lord our God, we are thankful as always and come once again before your word. And we ask that today, even in this tragic passage about the loss of one of your servants, 
that we might be moved to treasure up Christ all the more, that we might be seen how this is given to us for our comfort, inspiration, equipping us to live for you in the world in various ways. Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. They are many. Bless the reading and the preaching of your word to bring forth fruit in our hearts to love you more and to serve you better. And we ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, franchise movies and, and television shows, that sort of thing, seem to crash when they replace the, the actor or actress uh, playing the main character. I mean, it is hard to imagine Indiana Jones if Harrison Ford wasn't in the lead. It'd be hard to envision Jack Sparrow if it wasn't Johnny Depp. The, I mean, the Transformers movie, as wobbly as they were, in premise, unraveled when they changed the main characters repeatedly. And I guess there's debates about who the best James Bond is. Don't ask me because I have strong opinions about how it has crashed recently. Anyway, uh, the contemporary, the point is that the contemporary evangelical church often works along the same lines, imbibing a celebrity culture. Right, there, there are various high-profile churches who have failed to find a, a successor for their well-known pastor or found a successor but discarded him when he wasn't everything they wanted. Or even churches that have completely collapsed when their celebrity pastor crashed and burned in scandal. Parachurch organizations are... Another beast in general that follow this pattern in a significant way many times. In these cases, the, the center of spiritual gravity was not in the church itself, but in a personality. In Mark 6, particularly verses 14 to 29, we find the kingdom of God confronted with how to respond to the problem of losing the, at one time, forerunner of their movement. John the Baptist dies at the hands of a debauched civic ruler, forcing John's followers to reckon with what their leader's death meant for the future of God's kingdom as it was arriving in the Messianic era. And we need to wrap our heads as we... As we try to get a sense of the, the significance and meaning of this passage, we need to wrap our heads around some of the on-the-ground aspects of history behind this passage in Mark's Gospel. So we, from our vantage point, know good and well who Jesus is, but in our passage we see how at the particular point in time when Herod killed John, well, Jesus seemed to be still lesser known than John the Baptist was. Jesus was becoming known, as Mark tells us. In verses 14 to 16, Mark noted for us how Herod even thought that Jesus might be John the Baptist, resurrected as, as now, now that as Jesus was becoming known after the fact of John's death. In verse 15, other people are trying to figure out who Jesus was. As Mark 1.14 records for us, and reminds us all the way back there, that Jesus didn't begin his public ministry or public preaching until after John was already arrested. And so this, this lengthier account of, of John's death is, is, in a sense, a flashback, likely occurring closer in time to the events of chapter 1, but placed here to give us a background for why, well, people are oddly suggesting that Jesus was John, resurrected as the disciples spread his name and message and his public profile increased. So the, the scope of Mark 6, 1 to 30 is is not exactly a, a straightforward instance of, of one of Mark's sandwich passages. 
Because normally these literary uh, sandwiches are structured that Mark begins one story, interrupts it to tell a second story, and then finishes the first story. And really what's going on is that all of verses 1 to 44 is less like a literary sandwich and more like a wrap. Um, the, the layers aren't quite as clear, but there are several events tied together using the same sort of, of storytelling technique. And we saw last time how verses 1 to 13 are bound together in the contrast of rejection and the resulting mission in Jesus' hometown and from his hometown. The events of verses 7 to 30 are then a sandwich as it opens with the disciples sent on mission, interrupts with the account of John the Baptist's death, and finishes with the disciples' return in verse 30. And we'll think next week about how verses 31 to 44 relate to all these events together too. Just like the contrasting events in verses 1 to 13 prompted us to wrestle with the relationship of rejection and fruitfulness, so too the, the relationship of, of the disciples' mission and, and John's death also make us think about how the kingdom of God progresses in the context of seemingly overt failure, but having overlooked fruitfulness. So our passage again forces us into the mystery of God's kingdom, that it, it has continually an unexpected manner and unexpected progress. We then have to grapple with the way that we respond to the same phenomena of when we perceive failure today when God promises fruitfulness for his kingdom. So our main point is that Christ prevails even when our greatest earthly hopes collapse. Christ prevails even when our greatest earthly hopes collapse. And our three points today are confrontation, contrast, and contentment. So first, let's let's think about confrontation. So this this story before us of John the Baptist's death tells us how and why Herod Antipas killed him. Ultimately, because John rattled the cages of the cultural elites by challenging their morality. Right? They. Uh, Herod had illegitimately married his, his brother's wife, and John called him out on it. This story is meant to locate the, the true advance of God's kingdom in the context when it probably appeared to be falling apart to the first century adherents. So there's a scene in uh, Return of the Jedi... <laughs> Uh, the last Star Wars movie that actually counts. Um, the, the Rebel Alliance destroys the Death Star for the, the second time. Uh, and the big finale explosion, you know, the, the spaceship, the, the Millennium Falcon is flying through the, the space station, uh, having to shoot the, the engine, the reactor inside, and then fly out of it. And the big escape shows flames bursting out of the ventilation hatch. First, are they destroyed? And then they zoom out safely, unscathed. The exciting bit of the victory is how heroes burst successfully from within the context of destruction that had seemingly enveloped them. And Mark presents really a similar context where we're meant to be excited as heroes burst forth from the context of seeming destruction into victory. The, the sad factor in Mark's story is that the context of this failure is the death of another hero in the story, namely John the Baptist. 
The context of, of John's own death was his confrontation with Herod and the Herodian family. Now it's interesting, in, I mean it starts out in verse 14 and, and it's repeated a few times that Mark called Herod king. Herod. But Herod was at, never truly the king. In fact, he was deposed and exiled from the Roman Empire because he asked the Romans to give him the title of king. And they refused and booted him out. So what's happening here is that Mark is ironically deriding Herod, calling by calling him the title he wanted but never got. And setting a contrast between the one who wants to be called king and what the kingdom is actually doing. Now I tried to think of a modern illustration of how this sort of ironic uh, insult might work in modern politics or religion. But the problem is when you try to illustrate someone taking a dig at someone, uh, you end up taking a dig at someone. And so uh, I don't have an illustration uh, for this. But the point of Mark's dig on Herod is to point out the irony of how the man who wanted to be king tries to suppress God's kingdom while the true king, Jesus himself, is growing the ultimate and true kingdom all around him through gospel preaching. The appearances don't match the reality. The nature of John's confrontation with Herod and the Herodian family gives us some insight, I think, into what Christian cultural engagement ought actually to be like. I think most often uh, culture warriors today want to fight to obtain the sort of society they want through the civic leaders. In other words, they, they want to fight the culture by using our leaders for it, which means gaining the ear of those leaders, which means buddying up to those leaders, which means having them on hand and having them associated with our movement, our church, even. John challenged the civic leader himself about his morality. Biblically, the engaging culture is not about using political tools to build a set of policies to protect the sort of life that we like. We should indeed work through the channels we have to build a good society where justice is present, but that's not, uh, that's a matter for when we, that is a matter for when we get to render unto Caesar, not for our passage today. John thought that engaging the culture meant calling out sin wherever we see it, whomever is committing it. John uh, then shows us that sin is, is actually a bipartisan issue. And by that I mean that we can do this, whoever's in office, every politician is a sinner, and I, I don't think I have to defend that claim. Every single one. Sin is in all the political parties around all the world, and the church's role as the kingdom of God in this age is not to pick a side and pretend that its candidate is a good moral example, if they're not, even if we like their policies, right? And, and, think they, and we might think that they do a better job politically serving the pulpit, the pu public. That's fine. But our job in the church is to preach the law and the gospel so that sinners of every strata of society repent and believe in Jesus. That's what we see as cultural engagement. Our confrontation is with all sin and unbelief, just like John's was. And that brings us to our second point, contrast. Uh, so we need to get ourselves inside the story a little bit more. And if we do that, we can see just how explosive this narrative is for how we think about failure and fruitfulness in God's kingdom. 
John the Baptist was really the, the final Old Testament prophet, even though he's discussed in the New Testament. We read Malachi 4, that God would send Elijah again, the, the consummate prophet, coming once more. Isaiah 40, verse 3, records God promising the forerunner of the Messiah, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And John was that prophet. Before Jesus' name ascended to preeminence in his own time, John was the face of the movement to hope for the arrival of God's kingdom. He was the leading figure. And we come back to imagine our favorite franchise or just a quintessential character apart from the actor who played the pivotal role. For the first believers who were hoping for the arrival of God's kingdom announced through John, they would find it very difficult to imagine the movement going forward without John as the figurehead. And so when when Herod killed John, those hoping for the arrival of God's kingdom likely had their hopes fully unraveled. The cultural elites just squashed the kingdom of God. The leading figure heralding God's kingdom was just silenced outwardly. Things appeared grand for God's kingdom as its foremost herald was put to death. And now now we see why Mark nestled this story of John's death in the, in the context of Christ sending his disciples out to proclaim the gospel. And they saw much fruit. For all the high-profile appearance of failure, God's kingdom was again bringing its own fruitfulness. And so we learn yet again not to expect God's kingdom to run along the parameters that we set for it. We learn that God blesses his kingdom to work according to his rules, not ours. We learn to have hope in the midst of what seems like defeat because God is at work in the places and in the ways that are often beyond our ability to perceive. At, at, the, at the human level, as we look at it, the, the shocking features of the, the whole sweep of, of Mark 1 to 30, or sorry, Mark 6, 1 to 30, highlight the, the inversion of normal expectations. Right last week in verses 1 to 6, we saw how Jesus was rejected, even amongst his hometown people. We would think that at one level, God the Son himself would be the most obviously (coughs) successful, since he is the one who is all sovereign and knows and guides the hearts of men. In, In verses 14 to 29, John the Baptist, the the God-appointed successor to Elijah and forerunner of the Messiah faces the ultimate rejection of being put to death for challenging Herod's morality. So in between these two high-profile apparent failures, Jesus' disciples of all people proclaimed the good news, cast out lots of demons, and healed the sick. They were the ones seemingly least likely to prevail and yet proved to be the most fruitful. So the contrast of of expectations teaches us about how how sure the hope in God's kingdom is. We learn never to lose heart. We learn that God can use the least expected means, even the least expected people. We learn that even when things seem like they are unraveling and melting down, God may be accomplishing rich 
victories in ways that we don't yet perceive. And that brings us to our final point, contentment. The whole dynamic of this narrative points to the cross because there we see the ultimate instance of true fruitfulness amidst seeming failure. Victory within perceived defeat. But that's not an arbitrary leap. Even the story's structure points us that way, giving us a foreshadow of what is to come. Herod is, in some ways, driven to kill John despite some apparent reluctance on his part. He was glad to hear John. He put him in prison, but he was glad to hear him, it says. He didn't want to execute him, but felt obligated to do it. Herodias and her daughter push him that direction, and John dies because of that. At the climax of the gospel story, The crowds push Pontius Pilate to kill Christ, despite some apparent reluctance on his part. John the Baptist's death then foreshadows and readies us for the pinnacle passion narrative when Christ gives up his life. The difference between the stories, of course, makes all the difference. Whereas John died Because of his faith serving Christ, Christ died, well, to give us faith. Christ died in our place because we are sinners. Christ endured seeming defeat because we deserve defeat. He rose from death so that his victory would be ours. As he stands in heaven as a pledge that his people will follow after him there, we are assured that whatever apparent defeat swirls around us in this age, unbounded blessings wait before us. The world often feels chaotic. We can easily latch on to the fallen aspects of life that trouble us. And those troubles can quickly overwhelm us. But God is at work amidst defeat. God brings fruitfulness from failure. The barometers of this age, well, they are not our final authority, nor the right gauge even to use. We cling to the promise of the world not yet seen, knowing that everything that traps our hearts in doubt now is but the world's death throes as God's victory barrels down the tunnel of history for the good of his people. And so our our main payoff in all of this is to learn contentment. Even in the moments that should be most unsettling from the human perspective. Christ has guaranteed the end of all things. God has numbered each of our days. And it's a beautiful thing. I think think we often think that this claim means he's determined the end of our life in the negative sense. If this is the thing that's going to get me well, then it's the thing that's going to get me. As if we don't know which trial will be our undoing, assuming that it's our present trial. We know contentment in the Lord, however, when we, when we see the positive sense that really is built into all that we've thought about today. The positive sense of God numbering our days. Even though the present trial may be the thing that seems like it should defeat us, God is the one who's numbered our days. Which may mean carrying on well beyond our present affliction. Christians then learn to watch the horizon of history with optimism, 
even in our darkest moments, because we know Christ is coming and he will bring fruitfulness rather than failure. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God, we are easily overwhelmed by the things that we see around us. We are easily taken aback when things go well, despite how they seem to be unraveling. And we know, though, that we belong to the sovereign God who works in precisely these ways. We, in some ways, repent of all the times that we are caught off guard by how you bring good out of awful situations, how you bring fruitfulness out of failure. And yet we know that such is the pattern of the gospel, that you have brought life out of death, life to us from the death of Christ, victory for all your people out of the seeming defeat of your Messiah. And your kingdom marches on no matter what the world may look like. And so we are glad to belong to the God who has guaranteed your son's victory. We pray that you would encourage us and send us out hopeful. Teach us that contentment and optimism as we go about our weeks. We pray it in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's stand and sing to God's praise, Love Has Come. God receive your benediction now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen